All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started here. Uh, welcome to the November Northwest Gas Association webinar. My name is Connor Wrighton with the Northwest Gas Association, uh, and we're looking forward to uh, today's webinar because, as many of you who are uh, webinar regulars know, uh, we've been very focused on two areas this year. Uh, those being two uh, being new technologies that can take natural gas into the future, as well as natural gas vehicles. Uh, today we have a webinar that I think has implications for both of those subjects, uh, and we're glad to introduce Gary Fanger, uh, the Chief Operating Officer of Synergy Solutions, uh, who will be discussing adsorbed natural gas. Uh, before we begin, as always, uh, we'd like to review the basics for how the webinars work. Uh, we have set aside some time for questions, and we strongly encourage you to ask them as they come up. Uh, each of you will be muted throughout the presentation, so please use the text box in the GoToMeeting control panel uh, to type in your questions, and I will interject as needed to introduce those questions. Uh, for those of you who would like a PDF copy of this presentation, please send me an email at c-r-e-i-t-e-n at nwga.org and I will get you a copy before the close of business today. Uh, you can also do that uh, by just responding to the email that I sent with the link to this presentation this morning. As some of you may know, the Northwest Gas Association hosts webinars like this one each month, and next month we're gonna be closing out the year with a dual presentation by Jennifer Davison of the BC Ministry of Energy, Mines and Petroleum, and Scott Graham of Fortis, BC. Uh, Jennifer and Scott will be talking about British Columbia's Renewable Natural Gas Program. And as always, we ask that you look way ahead in your calendars and mark off both June 6th and 7th for next year's 15th Annual Energy Conference, which is once again at Skamania Lodge. And finally, I'd like to introduce the Northwest Gas Association for those of you who might not be familiar with us and what we do. Uh, we represent the six investor-owned gas utilities operating in the Pacific Northwest, along with the three large natural gas transmission lines. Our members are located in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and British Columbia. And as always, you can visit our website at nwga.org for more information or send me an email if you have any questions. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to pass things over to Gary and we will get started. So thank you, Connor. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating in this webinar. I think you'll find it to be interesting. Uh, Synergy Solutions is uh, located in uh, Fremont, California, is where we have our test center. We also have a location in Oakland and in Arkansas. Uh, Synergy Solutions mission, or their main goal uh, when they started was to get vehicles off of gasoline, diesel, and onto natural gas. And um, some of the owners, it's a self-funded uh, company, uh, it's privately held by either people in my family, myself, um, and a couple other shareholders. So it's a small company, but we have become the leader, uh, the world leader in uh, <clears throat> ANG technology or sor sorbent natural gas technology. So I just uh, was in India, uh, China, uh, it's, actually meeting with companies that had tried to work in this technology and struggled. Um, it looks like we're uh, going to be working with them to continue uh, their mission to make ANG work for them. I think I'm probably preaching to the choir, but uh, it's estimated that there's one trillion cubic feet of natural gas that's being flared each year. That's uh, 7.8 billion GGEs of natural gas. It's estimated that there's 1.6 trillion cubic feet of biogas that's vented each year. So that's 12.6 billion GGEs. This doesn't include the methane gas that is leaking that's not being captured uh, by a digester or in other situations. So just as a, an example, in China, there's 30 million digesters, small digesters, that are tied in with small farms. What these farmers do is they use it for cooking and any excess they vent. And based on our research, uh, it looks like most of the farm digesters around the world <clears throat> on small farms are venting about 80% of their biogas. Uh, they aren't even flaring it. So uh, fortunately here in the US, at least we flare it. 
why is all this gas being wasted, vented, flared, or allowed to uh, go into the atmosphere? I think these pictures are probably pretty familiar with you, is, is that our pipeline gas that comes to our homes or businesses, in most cases, is very low pressure. And you need a lot of density with natural gas to make it useful when running vehicles, generators, or other types of vehicles. So this has been a big problem. Uh, to compress that gas to 3,600 PSI, or sometimes even higher pressures than that, it gets to be very expensive. The capital costs, the ongoing energy costs, all of those uh, contribute to the fact that stranded gas <clears throat> is not uh, used. Um, I live in California. Uh, driving down to uh, one of the conventions in Southern California, uh, I noticed that there was an oil well uh, probably about 500 yards off of Highway 5, just before the grapevine going into to LA that was burning or flaring <clears throat> their gas. I have a city that's close to where our test center is. They're actually flaring 180,000 cubic feet of natural gas per day. So <clears throat> that's happening not just here in the US, but throughout the world. And the reason that that gas is being wasted is because it's too expensive to compress it, store it, and transport. Absorbent technology or absorbent natural gas uh, storage. It's been known about for some period of time, but basically how it works is, as you'll see to the left, these are replicas of particles, um, activated carbon particles. And what they do, it's like a magnet. They, under the right circumstances, they attract the molecules of the methane. So one five micron, particle of activated carbon can uh, store between three and four million molecules of methane. As you look to the right, the graph that you see there, uh, the bottom line is a graph <clears throat> of a empty CNG tank, and it has the different pressures there in bars. And you can see, based on the pressure, how much natural gas that cylinder can hold. The graph that's above it uh, the arc, that's if you have a natural gas ANG tank. And so you can store sometimes six, seven, <clears throat> eight times the amount of gas in an ANG tank as you can in a CNG tank at the same pressure. And so what this does is it helps us to be able to store gas at higher densities and low pressures, which is exactly what's needed to capture, store, and transport gas. For the last 25 years, many companies have worked on uh, commercializing ANG. Um, the University of Missouri, going back about 25 years ago, got together with uh, several natural gas companies and other businesses. And some of you might be part of that, I'm not sure. Um, and what they found is, is that activated carbon to store properly, you need fine particles uh, to make that happen. But once you have fine particles and you have those in a tank, it's hard to keep them in a tank. So as the gas was leaving, the particles would go with it. So one of the things they came up with is to put bonding material with the carbon. And you'll see different circumstances there. Uh, to the left, they're making hockey putts or hardened type bricks that uh, go into tanks so that they can store the gas and also keep the carbon in the gas or keep the carbon in the tank when the gas is leaving. Uh, BASF, one of the largest chemical companies in the world, uh, they have worms that they were using. Actually, I talked to the engineer, they started by putting bonding material with activated carbon or with moths and other types of absorbents and pushing it through a spaghetti making machine so that they could kind of bond it so it would stay in the tank. And you see in the center there that these worms, they also have space between uh, themselves. So you're losing capacity with the space that's in between the worms and also the fact that there's bonding material that goes along with that. So going back about four years ago, uh, we made a breakthrough in this technology to where at this point, we're virtually the only ones that 
are making it work in a commercial setting. And I'll explain why in a few minutes. This tank that you see to the right <clears throat> is uh, our first AMG tank. The individual standing on the ladder, Aaron Fevers, PhD, he's up there in Seattle. Uh, some of you might know him. Um, he's very uh, <clears throat> well educated when it comes to storing energy. Uh, the Department of Energy gave him over $20 million to build a plant to make activated carbon. And this activated carbon is being used for capacitors, but it also works to store methane gas. The person to the right that's standing there, he's the chemist that introduced this to me uh, some years ago. So this is our first ANG tank. And one of the things that made it so that we could commercialize this right from the beginning is the fact that we had a filter that would go inside the tank. And so you see the diagram to the right, that's actually from our patent. It's been filed both here in the US and around the world. And what it does is, is it can filter down to five microns. And so the dots are the activated carbon that's in the tank. So when the methane is introduced to the tank, it travels down this tube or this filter and it expands in the tank. In doing so, what it does is it cools the activated carbon. And activated carbon likes to absorb when it's cold. And so some of the problems that the previous companies had was getting the carbon to absorb in a timely manner, to keep it in the tank, and to also to get it to desorb. And that's where this filter helps also in the desorption process. Most importantly, it's making it so that the PRD can work. So the pressure relief device in a catastrophic situation has to be able to release the gas in a very short period of time. If you're not filtering that gas before it's leaving the tank, what it'll do is it'll clog the PRD, the valves and other things that are involved. So this is a hurdle that we got past um, four years ago and have been building upon it ever since. You'll see a little bit uh, closer view what the filter looks like. Uh, basically, there's a mesh that goes over a stainless steel tube. This mesh is stainless steel also, and it filters down to five microns. It makes it so that the gas leaves, the carbon stays in the tank. Uh, we filed with the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, they have over 152 countries that are members. And um, this particular patent that we filed with them, uh, they came back after doing an extensive search and looking into it and said that this is a novelty invention and met all the criteria for patentability. And so we have filed in 61 countries and we're filing in seven more in 2018. What this does is it makes it so that Synergy Solutions will continue to be a leader in this particular uh, technology because PRDs will not work without the filter. We also heard from our attorney that the U.S. Patent Office contacted him a couple of weeks ago, and that we'll have a U.S. patent in the next um, in the next couple of uh, months. These are some of the vehicles that <clears throat> we've run on ANG. The one in the center, it's an 8.1 liter uh, engine. That's the first one we ran. Ran it under lots of different loads. Um, 20,000 miles on activated carbon. It's the largest uh, engine that goes into vehicles. And um, we got plenty of flow. We could run it uh, under load, uh, low pressure under the hood so that um, we didn't have any issues with the, with the uh, particular engine being starved of gas. And to the left, um, about a year and a half ago, Ford asked us if we would convert an F-150 with a conformable tank in the back, which we did. And it's still running on activated carbon. Uh, to the right is a Honda Civic, um, because under the hood, that particular system runs at a higher pressure. Uh, we don't get such good results from that particular engine because we can only run the tank down to about 110 PSI. And as you saw in the graph before, activated carbon stores most of its gas in low pressures. 
And so the systems that have to be used in vehicles <clears throat> needs to be a low pressure system under the hood. Uh, Synergy Solutions has gotten EPA approval for over 150 models of vehicles uh, throughout the US. And these are biofuel vehicles. They can run on both <clears throat> natural gas or on gasoline. This is a conformable tank. It's in the back of the uh, F-150. It's the first one that's ever uh, been, been used for this type of application. It um, has a fill regulator, so you can actually fill it up at a fueling station, and it cuts off at 450 PSI. And so this tank working pressure is actually 480 PSI, <clears throat> but you can fill it up on a slow fill or you can fill it up on a fast fill. When you have rectangular or square shapes, you can save up to, you can gain about 48% in volume uh, in replacing cylinders in that same space. This type of technology uh, can be used in many different applications. Uh, Agility wants to test uh, these, this technology and these types of tanks on some of the vehicles uh, that they're putting out there. And we'll probably be doing that in the near future. I'm actually in Illinois and meeting with a tank manufacturer that uh, manufactures propane tanks. And uh, the reason we're meeting with them is, is that Activated carbon allows you to be able to um, transport large amounts of natural gas um, in tanks, whether it's on trailers, uh, rail, uh, possibly ships, and <clears throat> where you have LNG, and that's a liquid natural gas, ANG is kind of a step above that, in that you get the density, not quite a liquid form, but pretty close to it, uh, but you get the cost savings of the lower pressure, and also you don't have any uh, burn off of the methane. So you're not losing any of the methane over time. In fact, one of our uh, scientists said that uh, these ANG tanks could sit there forever and be kind of a ba battery pack for generators. Um, <clears throat> the fuel won't go bad, the activated carbon won't go bad, and so you can continue to um, uh, to use it uh, over long periods of time. So this allows the uh, capability of transporting both a natural gas or biogas um, very inexpensive. Um, we've had situations where, you know, we've been contacted actually by a utility company who's talked about using these tanks for buffer tanks in areas where the infrastructure was not uh, enough to handle a certain load that these tanks on off periods could be used as a buffer tank. Also moving gas <clears throat> from stranded areas to where it can be utilized or put into the pipeline. Uh, same thing with biogas. One of the big problems with biogas is, is that, you know, you're out on a farm in a rural area, you don't have a place that you can put the gas or use the gas. This opens up the door to be able to move that gas. Uh, remember, activated carbon acts like a sponge, so it likes it likes to hang on to that methane until there's certain circumstances that that, that happen. So we believe that you know both in wellhead storage, uh, biogas storage, uh, storage for utility companies, um, <clears throat> buffer storage, that it has applications in those areas. You can also retrofit any LPG tank with an ANG system. And we've been doing this for about a year and a half. And <clears throat> what happens is, is that um, instead of having LPG in the tank, you can have ANG. In fact, um, about a month ago, I told my wife that it was the last propane tank that we would be using on our barbecue. From now on, it's gonna be an ANG tank. And I have a compressor. Uh, that's CSA and UL approved in the garage, I can fill up vehicles, or I can fill up my barbecue tank, or you know whatever else I'm using uh, the gas with. Uh, and so this is an application uh, that we believe is gonna be useful, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world. 
we have a compressor uh, that is UL approved, has a UL sticker on it, it's CSA approved, and it can go in the garage or actually anywhere indoors. And it's low pressure, uh, so it works well with ANG. And this is a small ANG tank farm uh, that was set up for companies or biogas uh, companies outside the U.S. to where they would actually fill these tanks. These tanks would go to somebody's home. They would use it for cooking and bring it back when it's empty. And uh, same thing here in the U.S. Um, we've got propane tanks that are, you know, feeding barbecues and homes and businesses. Um, there's no reason that you can't do that with natural gas or biogas. Um, we believe that this is a um, certainly a system that will work going forward. One of the things I wanted to clarify is, is that activated carbon, it does take some time to absorb the gas. And so our particular compressor, it's automated fill. So it fills it up to the working pressure. And then as it absorbs and the pressure drops, it goes back on again. And it continues to do that until the tank is filled. There's lots of different markets for this technology, uh, certainly vehicles, uh, fueling stations, uh, transporting, uh, storing at wellheads, uh, biogas plants. Um, you know, since we first started in this technology with uh, the vehicles, many other doors have opened up. We've been contacted by companies and countries around the world, and uh, certainly here in the US. are safer, cleaner, and cheaper. So we believe that they can be used to capture natural gas and biogas before it's vented or flared, um, reduce natural gas and biogas leakage, uh, used to replace fossil fuel, um, reduced capital costs for compressors and transportation, uh, reduced energy costs for ongoing compression, and reduced costs for low-pressure vehicles. So everything that has to do with low pressure uh, storage is a savings. Uh, the fittings, the valves, the regulators, everything that goes along with it doesn't have to go to 3,600 PSI or whatever the pressure is. It can be rated for a much uh, lower pressure. So that's pretty much uh, what this is about. It, I didn't want to make it too complicated, but what I'd like to do is if people have questions, uh, certainly answer those questions. Is everybody there? Thanks, Gary. Yep. If anybody has a question, I ask that you please use that chat box uh, down in the GoToMeeting control panel. Um, I will type a message here just to give everybody a, a sense for where that is. And also, I just want to remind people uh, that, as always, we have recorded this uh, and the, um, the whole show, the, both the audio and the video, uh, will be available on our YouTube channel, uh, just as you can with the slides. Uh, you can request a link to that by sending me an email uh, at c-r-e-i-t-e-n at n-w-g-a dot org. We'll give people just a couple more minutes here to, uh, to put their questions in, but we've got the first two here, uh, so I will just read those off for you. The first being, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the time requirements to fill a tank versus CNG? Yes, so um, it depends on what application you're talking about, but <clears throat> you can go to a fuel fueling station and fill your tank as quickly as you can a CNG tank in, say, three minutes but you're only going to get about 80% of the gas. And that depends on how much is left that's already in the tank that's been absorbed. You know, regardless of what tank you use, gasoline, diesel, CNG, there's always some gas left in it. And that's even more particularly important with ANG because it stores it at low pressure. So you can fill fast, or if you're going to fill a slow fill and you're going to get absolute most you can get in that tank, 
you know, it could take up to five to six hours. But most all your gas is stored um, right at right up front, and then certainly within a couple hours, you have uh, a good percentage of your gas stored. And that all depends again on, um, you know, how much gas is still absorbed onto the uh, activated carbon. So our second question here, I'm just going to read it uh, as it was written. So the advantage is that you're hauling around uh, cylinders that are much lower pressures. What about the range? We've got a couple of questions about range here. So um, you cannot, so uh, let me put it this way. At, at low pressures, say at 450 PSI, you're not going to store as much in that tank as you would a 3600 PSI tank. But if you take that same space that you stack cylinders in, or that you have a cylinder, and you square those edges out, you're going to increase your volume by 48%. So you're going to get closer uh, to where you want to be as far as range is concerned. If you fill <clears throat> one of our ANG tanks up, let's say it's got a working pressure of 3,600 PSI, if you fill that tank up to 3,600 PSI, you will store about 10% more gas in an ANG tank as you will in an empty tank. And so the, the curve, they, they pretty much meet each other in the 3000 uh, PSI range. So the other thing that you need to remember is if you can fill up each day at your home, the way I do it is I pull the car up, open the garage door, and I do a quick enough. And as I walk through the door into the house, I push a button, the compressor goes on, I close the garage door, um, the, and the car starts filling. And uh, you don't have to worry about the compressor. It's, uh, it's like an appliance that you have at the house. So most people fill up once or twice a week, sometimes maybe once every two weeks. Um, you know, that's the habit they're in. But, you know, being able to fill up at home uh, gives you a full tank every time you leave your leave your house or business. And so businesses, the same situation. They come back um, and, you know, we can manifold these out to, you know, put as many vehicles on there as you want, depending on the capacity of the compressor. Or you do a quick connect and you walk away and uh, it's filled when you come back. Next question here. Uh, many sources of natural gas have varying components in them other than CH4. Uh, how does your absorbent uh, or adsorbent material react uh, to H2S or ethanes and butanes, et cetera? Well, sometimes I think it's a living organism because it does react to certain things. So uh, what, I, what we know is, is that moisture is not healthy for activated carbon. Uh, the same thing with oil. And so those need to be filtered uh, before the gas goes into the tank. Now we can regenerate the activated carbon. Uh, activated carbon will last is a lot longer than your car will last. Uh, but if you get a lot of moisture or oil in there, um, it might have to be taken out of the tank and you can regenerate it with heat. So um, other types of uh, hydrocarbons and things, they come off with the methane. We're doing some tests for because of biogas uh, storage. We're doing some tests with CO2 to see how that's going to impact it. But everything we've seen in the last four years is that what goes in the tank comes back out the other side. It's burned with the engine. Well, you may have just ad addressed this, but um, from the perspective of biogas, how clean does that gas have to be uh, to avoid damage to the tanks? Well. The H2S has to come out, uh, so that's critical. Um, the moisture needs to come out. So those are the two key components. And then we're doing some testing uh, in the next few weeks because we have uh, several biogas plants that would like to um, <clears throat> use this technology to move their biogas to central locations to take out the CO2. So we are going to be testing uh, both a mixture of methane and CO2 to see you know, what's going in and what's coming out. Great. So how do you compare the cost of an ANG cylinder uh, compared to an LPG cylinder? 
what valving is required on a dedicated ANG cylinder? Well, as you saw in the pictures before this, you can actually convert an LPG tank to be an ANG tank. And, uh, you know, you can go down to Home Depot and buy uh, an LPG tank and valve for $29. Um, and so they're certainly made for a lot less than that. The problem is, is that the working pressure on those tanks is 250 PSI. So, um, you know, our conformable tanks are, I would say, with all the carbon and with the filter and the valve and everything, is comparable in price to a type four tank. And so, you know, it's certainly more than a type one and probably a type two, but uh, when you get to your type threes, Fours, um, we start to get to have a comparable price. And again, once we start mass producing these, uh, we believe that you know the price is going to obviously come down. So this is a, kind of the beginning of this. Uh, it's not the beginning of the technology, but you know, for it to be used commercially, you know, that's something that's been done fairly recently. We we started about four years ago. We've got uh, one. Uh, Van, CNG van that's been in a fleet uh, for the last two years, and he would like the rest of his vehicles converted to ENG vehicles. So, so there's a there's a lot of potential for vehicles. Um, we, you know, we believe probably the, the shorter term uh, applications are the virtual pipeline and the replacement of LPG tanks. So with each consecutive filling, is there a diminishing volume of CNG storage? Um, you shouldn't be so pessimistic. Um, actually, you get better storage uh, with more uh, <clears throat> cycles. And the reason is, is what happens is when you put the carbon in, there's some impurities uh, that go in with it. Um, and then as you use the carbon over time, it's kind of like when you have a cold, you drink lots of fluid to flush yourself out. The same thing happens with uh, activated uh, carbon. So to give you an idea, this van I was talking about, we took it out of service to test it, and we could store more in the tank after one year of use than we could uh, when we first put it in. And we had a physicist that uh, you know, had been working on ANG for over 20 years, and, and he, he also reiterated the fact that uh, that's what happens is as you put clean methane gas into the tank, it's clearing out the other impurities and helping you to be able to store more gas. Another possibility is, is that maybe some of the particles through the vibration are breaking down to be smaller, <clears throat> which means that you can uh, store more gas on smaller, smaller particles. Great. It looks like we've got a sort of comment in a question here, which is uh, the benefit is being able to fill from home with a quarter PSI pressure. The barbecue gas is convenient as well, but are the propane like cylinders constructed the same way as the propane tanks? Uh, is there increased wall thickness? Uh, there's no increased uh, wall thickness. And, you know, again, we're, uh, there's certain regulations that have to do with um, CNG tanks, natural gas tanks, and that's what we consider these. And so they go through uh, the same tests uh, that are needed. And so uh, the wall thickness depends on how much pressure you're going to put in the tank, what type of working pressure uh, you need for that tank. Sure. Uh, so the next one, I'll, I'll read this again. Uh, it is my understanding that the biogas cannot be moved from its source for removal of H2S or other impurities and still qualify for RIN credits. Is that true? Uh, you're asking the wrong person. The person that uh, handles that for our company, he just left here a while ago. So I, I can't answer that for you. But if you email me that question, I'll find the answer out and email you back. <laughs> Great, again, we'll, uh, we'll give a, another minute or so for folks if you wanna type uh, more questions in there. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, really want to thank Gary for taking the time to do this. Uh, this has been a great presentation, and we are looking forward to getting this up on our, our YouTube page for those of you who may want to, uh, to review pieces of it or uh, to send around to others who you think might be interested. Um, 
again, please send me an email uh, if you'd like to uh, to see uh, the link for that or for the PDF copy of these slides. Uh, that'd be C-R-E-I-T-E-N at N-W-G-A.org. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention for folks before we uh, log off here is that uh, I want to make things as easy as possible for you to, to come back and, and join us again next month and in the, uh, the months after that. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we've had a, a little bit of difficulty today um, with uh, getting some sign-ins. Uh, once we get to about 9 or 10 o'clock uh, on the day of these, uh, please don't uh, sign up on our website anymore, but send me an email uh, if you'd like to sign up. We want to get you uh, get you involved if we can and uh, get as many folks um, on the webinars as possible. So. Uh, I will get those uh, bits of information that I've promised out to those who email me here this afternoon. Uh, thank you again to Gary, and we will see everybody again uh, next month. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, everybody.